Okay, everybody, welcome once again to our, our RDA Tech Q and A we hold here. Um, I'm Nash. I have a uh, way too many years of uh, tech and repair stuff under my belt, professionally and uh, amateurly. That's a word, right? Yeah. 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 I word. Uh, this gentleman over here is my producer, Mike Gearman. He uh, also has got a considerable background in tech and those sort of things. If you have questions for us that we may be able to help you fix something or come up with a way around something or make something stuff, and not just computer stuff, other stuff too. We mess around with things. Um, send it to request at radiodeadair.com. Put tech q and A. In the subject line. Yeah, not everything, though. We, we can't help you identify a rash. Hmm. I can't help them identify a rash. Hmm. Can't or don't want to? I won't help them identify a rash. I won't do it. Don't need the lawsuit. Ah, so, well... Um, we've got questions coming up, but first off, this has been an interesting little week in tech, especially in terms of broadband. Um, it has. One thing that if you're pay any attention to the stuff we do here, you'll know is that I hate Comcast. I, I'm unabashed about this. I'm not even in the slightest bit attempting to be impartial or neutral on them. I fucking hate Comcast. We all kind of hate Comcast. Comcast is is just they're horrible, horrible, and they should go away. Um, but the problem being, and this is whether it's Comcast, Time Warner, any other cable provider in the United States, Comcast and other cable providers own their infrastructure, and they have made it damn clear that they don't want to let anybody else play in their sandbox, which is the series of tubes that allows cable to go to your house. Which is why, if, if you happen to be in one of those areas, which are increasingly fewer, that is covered by multiple cable companies, they're each running their own lines. Yeah, they, which, which doesn't make much sense, but they have to have their own cables even running parallel to each other, which doesn't make much sense. Um, a recent check found that 70% of homes or locations that have a, uh, a connection which is now considered broadband, which is 25 megabits per second, 70% of those are either on Comcast or Time Warner Cable. Two companies control 70% of that, that that's that's nuts. And they do not compete with each other because most places they don't overlap at all. Yeah, overlapping when they do, it's very, very tiny slivers that are reflective of bizarre changes over time. Uh, in Los Angeles, for example, their their overlap is minuscule. And there's actually a couple places that neither of them serve. And so you've got situations where people in that area complain heavily because they can't get Dodgers games. So what, well, one of the alternatives has been fiber, which uh, is, you know, it's a, it's requires, in some instances, we have what's called dark fiber, which is fiber optics that were laid when the tech boom was, was this in the 90s, I think, they laid fiber optic cables? Yeah, yeah. Uh, dark fiber laid that was uh, never been activated. Nope. Or was activated briefly and has been deactivated since. And companies like Google will either come in and activate that dark fiber or lay fiber of their own. Now, that's good because it's an it's another competitor, but it's bad because there's a lot of regulatory hurdles and other issues to cover. You have to dig up streets. You have to uh, install very, very costly infrastructure. To allow for fiber connection, which is that, and that has been the infrastructure problem has been the biggest hurdle to new competitors entering the broadband marketplace. We don't have in other countries they have what's called local loop unbundled, which allows your 
internet service provider to make use of cables that have already been laid. And they all, you know, there's one person who handles it, and they pay them a small fee, and then they, they provide to you, and there's competition that way because they all share the pipes. In America, we don't have that. No. Except, again, in certain very, very limited areas. So the, we, the, the situation does not allow for competition, but... And the companies are very keen on keeping it this way if you can uh, track even count such things by how many congressmen they bought. Mm. Which is why disruptive technology is so important to this. And why I mention this is um, the the comp- one company that already has a little bit of a history with disruptive technology is coming in to maybe disrupt the cable duopoly. And um, the former CEO of Arrow... I remember them. Yeah. Um, Arrow, what they did was they had this little cute, and and they played around the legal edges and they kind of got burned for it. What they did was they... they Hammered. Hammered. Okay, yeah. they got What they did was they set up a company where they had a tiny antenna on their building that you could rent. And then by renting that antenna, you could get local over-the-air channels and stuff Download even if you weren't local to that area. Right, stream to your computer because you rented that antenna from them, and it allowed. You know, it was a rebroadcast and big legal thing. Supreme Court smashed them to pieces. It was a big problem. Well, here, they're starting a new company, which I really like. Uh, it's called Starry Internet, and what they're trying to do is use a technology called millimeter wave broadcasting. Okay. To transmit gigabit internet through the air. Interesting. <laughs> the look on Mike's face is like. Okay, it can, it can work. Yeah. Now, millimeter wave broadcasting has been used by the military for similar purposes because it is fairly robust. It's in an unlicensed and uh, level of the spectrum that no one else is really using. And it is potentially what this will allow you to do is have wireless broadband to your home, no cables, no cable company. They're not talking about data caps. They're just... They say what kind of speeds they'd, they'd be given. Gigabit. Which is, that's really nice. Um, it, does, it, and does it sound too good to be true? Potentially, yes. Let's, let's go through the pros and cons. Obviously, the first pro is low infrastructure. What you're seeing in this picture here is the antenna. I, it's a link. What? Oh, phone. Oh, yeah, that helps if I sent you a link. I don't even know what the fuck was going on. Um, what you're seeing in this picture here is the antenna, which presumably can be mounted in your, a window or on your roof, sort of like a dish TV, uh, or a direct TV antenna. Looks like it's got a smaller footprint too. Yeah. Um, what you do is you connect that to your cable router and that's your modem. That, that's what connects you to the system. Um... In terms of infrastructure, what they're going to be doing is using the Level 3 network. Level 3 is a trunk provider for the Internet. They're going to connect to them and set up what are essentially kind of a version of cell towers in cities. And, you know, that's not kind of a bad idea. um, And... It would allow pretty much a fairly wide, depending on how many cell networks, cell towers they set up, it would allow fairly wide coverage of a city area. Now, what other issues could potentially pop up with this? Millimeter wave requires line of sight broadcast. Okay, so. That means you have to have a clear line from the antenna to the broadcast site. 
Millimeter wave also does not penetrate walls or other physical structures very well. And it's been known to screw up in heavy rainfall. Okay, that's I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. So work how they're going to work around that? I'm not entirely sure. Not available in Seattle. No. Well, the, the first test. <laughs> yeah. 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 The first test market for this is going to be Boston. That that rolls out in June. Um. Okay. The the other there are some other considerations on this too. It is a beta now. Will it work to replace broadband? At this point, it's anyone's guess. Like I said, it is military tech. It has been been tried before. It's it's something that has some reliability behind it. Obviously, at the very, at the very least, it will cause the built-in guys to go, "Oh shit, another competitor. We better make our product that much more attractive to people." So, yeah, that would mean Comcast, would, if someone would say we we're potentially switching to this, Comcast may lower its prices. And that's good, because Comcast's prices are kind of artificially inflated. If you'll ever notice, whenever Comcast ha or Air Time Warner or any of the others, whenever a competitor moves into their area, Comcast prices mysteriously drop. Almost as if it wasn't costing them that much, really, to provide you with internet in that area to begin with, you play with great. Uh, you can't see him. Brady's over here playing with his little ball while I'm in the middle of the show. I'm gonna make noise. Great, thanks, Cat. Good boy, making noise. Um. So if nothing else, it could scare Comcast, which I like. I really want this to work. I seriously want this to be a potential because the big pro of having little to no infrastructure requirements is what we've desperately needed in the broadband market, in America at least, because like like Mike said, our, our uh, regulators are kind of bought and paid for when it comes to Comcast. Local loop unbundling is a faraway dream. And... The idea that technology alone could save us, oh, I wish, oh, I wish. I want them to, I want this to work. Uh, so I will be keeping a close eye on this. I actually, have to, there are some people I know in Boston who are already interested in this, so I'll keep in touch with them and see how, how well it works out. Of course, if I can't keep in touch with them, then we'll know how well it worked out. <laughs> um, so... There, I've got more cable stuff this week, though. Some, something that's good. If not one thing making them unhappy, I have another thing making them unhappy. Which makes me happy. Um, if you are receive cable television in your home, you will know that you have been required for the entirety of the time that cable's been out to possess a set-top box. Or device of some sort. Well, yeah, but normally you have, especially in the digital age, you have to have a box which comes from your cable company. Running down to the store and picking one of these up, not, not really, not an option. You have to get a box from your cable company. But you don't get to buy it from them. You rent it from them. In perpetuity. You have have to. There is no other options for this. If you want to watch television, you got to rent a cable box. And this, the calculations were um, upwards of $200 a year of your cable bill comes simply from renting a set-top box. And they don't always record it properly when you return the set-top box either. Nope. And if you don't, they charge you the full price for the thing, which is ridiculously high. You're, you're, you're charged $200 a year annually to rent a device that essentially, if sold at retail, would cost about $50. <clears throat> and if you don't return it, they charge you like $300. Yes. And if you can't return it because you say your house caught on fire, sometimes they don't believe you. 
or or tornadoes or Hurricane Katrina or other things, they don't believe you. And they still try to chart and they'll they'll chase you to the ends of the earth to get that three hundred dollars for something that doesn't cost nearly as much. Well, this week the FCC has proposed some new rules. Neighbors. Okay. FCC has proposed some new rules that will probably make the cable companies very, very unhappy. And already have. They're pissing them off. Yay! Um, what these rules are is that they want to stop the monopoly on cable boxes. They put forth a proposal that says anyone can build, well, not anyone, but you can buy a cable box from a third party and the cable company has to let you use it. Now, in reality, it'll probably be much like the way your cable modem works, hmm. where your cable company goes, well, okay, we've got to allow them. Here's the list of our allowed devices. Well, yeah, but there's also been talk of stuff like the Roku, the Apple TV box, other similar oh, yeah. devices. Yeah, some of them have built in depending on. Well, if you bought your, if you bought your, um, what's the one where it looks like a uh, dancing TV? Is that TiVo? TiVo, yes. If you bought your TiVo through Time Warner, then it counts as a set top box as well. Yeah, but what they're talking about is expanding it beyond the old paradigm of the cable card thing. For example, if this goes through and new standards get put in place, potentially you could have your Apple TV device, download an app, contact your cable provider, and that's it. Your existing device with just a little bit of software will be your new cable box. Yeah, and which means you won't have necessarily the call outs of, okay, yeah, we'll be there between four and eight. Yeah. But the, 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 the huge upside on this, well, for one thing, it's uh, Tom Wheeler estimates the cable companies make upwards of $20 billion annually on set-top box rentals. That's pure profit. That's pure profit. It just, what, because they don't have to make new ones very often. They'll just get back the old ones wipe them down with some lemon pledge, send them back out there, you use it. It doesn't cost them nearly that much to make it. They're essentially charging over and over and over for the same device. So naturally, of course, the, the cable companies are pissed off about this. And they're already protesting. They attempted to say, I swear to God, they attempted to claim that the FCC's plan to unbundle cable boxes and allow other people to make cable receiving devices violates the First Amendment. What? I know. I know. I know. It's, it's not speech saying this descrambles the signal it, it profit well now with the government saying money equals speech i don't know what's we scope was go to saying that so i expect when this goes to a vote because it'll eventually go to a vote in the fcc the fcc for those of you who aren't aware is a five person panel at the very top and it is traditionally split three from one political party two from the other with the three being whoever is the president's right. party. So right now it's three Democrats, two Republicans. And yeah. this will go like so many of the uh, splits have lately. All three Democrats voting for it and both Republicans voting against it. Because God forbid Compromise. people have more money in their pocket rather than the corporations have more money in their pockets. Here, li listen, th this is their reasoning this violates the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. The government is going to end up dictating the way the menus are presented to avoid discrimination. And it's going to dictate, of course, that the non, uh, 
cable boxes, old ones, have equal access to the menus. These are requirements to prescribe content, which the government cannot do absent a compelling interest. They're saying... They're saying the way that change channel appears on the screen is speech. By the way, your cat just ran by across the back. Oh yeah, it's time for the uh, Nightly Kitty races. He does that. Um, so yeah, I, I, that, that's, they're, they're really trying to say that that violates the first, you scum, you fucking scum. There's no other word for you, but you are scum. You scum. So, so this is, hopefully this could be a big boon. To those of you who are still, who haven't cut the cord yet, who still watch cable via a cable box. What this would mean is a device you already own potentially could function as your cable box. Or you could go out and purchase a simple one for much cheaper. And you would no longer have, to, your cable bill would be much happier in the long run. Um, one of the things from the uh, record, by the way, people ask, you know, how much, uh, how much really do these things cost? So the cable boxes, uh, the cost of the set top box over the past 20 years has risen 185%. And, you know, say over 20 years, well, that's not necessarily that bad. The cost of computers, televisions, and mobile phones has dropped 90%. 90%. Yeah, you're saying, wait, wait, when I first phone cost, you know, you know, $50 and my new one cost 400 Well, yes, but we were talking capabilities and and inflation and cost of living and there's people who make a lot of money calculating all these things out and i believe them on these numbers i guarantee you the hardware inside a roku which runs about fifty dollars for a, a basic model the hardware inside of a roku is far more complicated than the hardware inside of a cable box I'm and likely. yet the cable box costs 185 percent. no i doubt that i really seriously doubt that i seriously doubt that grady He's, hello, hello, buddy. He's he's got his mouse, and okay. You're 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 on hardwood. You you know this, don't you? you you're not going to be able to stop. Cat. You're going to kick it across the floor. Here's what's always going to happen. You're going to kick that across the floor, and then you're going to go skidding after it, and you're going to run into something like he always fucking does. <sighs> He'll learn anyway. So I think that pretty much takes care of the news for this week. Not a lot of news, but keep your eye on this if you're still a KO subscriber. It's it's kind of important, and it's it's it could ease up your cable bill considerably and put money back in your pocket. You know, two hundred dollars a year might not sound like a whole bunch, but that shit adds up. And it'd be nice to lower your cable bill just a fucking little. All right. So now we have, now that we've covered the news, we're, we have questions here. Oh, questions. Questions, 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 always. So before we actually get to the questions, I, I had a friend on my Facebook ask me, now I don't think he knows I do this show, hmm. but uh, or he's only very vaguely aware I do the show. He uh, put up a post last night tagging me and one other person saying, hey, uh, you guys do tech. Uh, what uh, wireless router should I get? I'm like, oh, I know the answer to this one. You just make an FAQ for the what wireless router? Right? Asus? Just get an Asus? Don't get a Netgear, get an Asus? Stay away from Netgear, stay away from uh, Linksys. Unless you need a doorstop. Linksys makes need... a very acceptable doorstop. Yeah, it does. It does. It's, it's that, that is, and it's good for the environment. Cat. Is he back there again? Yeah. God damn it. He's looking at the green screen now. Don't you jump on that fucking green screen, cat. <laughs> now he's walking away again. Okay, don't don't you jump on that fucking green screen. Because we're not doing that tonight. All Has right. Has he climbed the green screen yet? He he tried he has tried, yes. <laughs> he's he's I'll, I'll be honest, Nash. I'm waiting for the night on on the show where you've got something going on the green screen and suddenly a cat comes up the green screen. That that will be hilarious. Well, fortunately for me, he appears to be afraid of heights. <laughs> okay, so only a little bit of the green screen. Okay, All so what right. do we got? 
First one comes from Jared. Uh, he's asking, what are your recommendations for affordable and reliable external hard drives? He's got a much longer bit of stuff here, but I've got a kind of a outside answer. For this. Let me let me first start by saying <clears throat> lots of people have seen these little portable external hard drives um, like this. Yeah, like that. They're they're simple. They're cheap. And because they're cheap, they're kind of a little less reliable yeah. than, than normal. Well, this one happens to be a uh, Toshiba USB 3 one. Um, I got it when USB 3 had just come out, and it's, so it's a little flaky. Um, I don't keep important things on there. So I, you know, when it comes to these, I really do not recommend. Yeah, like you just said, I don't keep you don't keep important things on there. I really don't recommend them for backup purposes because they're made cheap. You cannot, they can't be fixed. If they break, if they, they broke. Um, yeah, yeah. This model especially, if 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 you got the model where it requires external power, you know, the models where it requires external mm -hmm. power. Generally speaking, those are internal hard drives given an external enclosure and an interface card to connect uh, uh, SATA to USB or something of that nature. Yeah, if they're if they're nice and heavy when you pick them up as an external hard drive, that's really an internal hard drive with a with a, a flashy enclosure. I've taken those apart at work multiple times to get the hard drive out because the interface card is what has died. The hard drive's fine. There that as a result, there's a I recommend going a completely different route with this sort of thing. And that route is what's called a docking station or an enclosure or something like that. And I'll, I'll put an example over here on the screen. Or maybe network attached storage. Yeah, that's, they're okay, but well, they're kind of the same thing. They're, they're... And when, you, when you get to a NAS enclosure with multiple hard drives in there, again, it's internal hard drives effectively. You're yeah. getting pricier significantly. The nice thing about the, and you see this, I'm putting it on the screen there. Thanks, Newegg, wonderful site. I don't get any money from them, but I have no problem saying they're a wonderful site. What this is, this little this little box you're seeing over here. I'm not seeing anything over there yet. It's, uh, it's, it's essentially a little stand that you plug a regular hard drive into, like the kind that you put inside a computer or a laptop. And it allows you to use uh, a full-featured regular hard drive as a USB drive. You just plug it in, and it works. And that is effectively by when I was saying, you know, you take that. I was taking apart uh, external hard drives. That's effectively what this is. It's just a much better card. Yeah. Connecting everything together. It is. Oh, there we go. Yes. It's essentially. It's, it's, it's a hard drive toaster. Yeah. You know how you used to plug in uh, Super Nintendo cartridges? Well, you plug in hard drives the same way. Yeah. You just slip the hard drive in place and it works like a Nintendo cartridge. And it's And there'll be a little lever just like a toaster that you use to pop the hard drives out. The useful thing about this is you can buy a quality hard drive that you know is already fairly reliable, plug it in, copy stuff to it, then disconnect it, put it on a shelf until you need it again. Nintendo cartridge. And not like toast. Instead of when it dies, you have to buy a whole new one. It probably won't die very soon. And you can just buy more. As many hard drives as you need, plug them in as needed, disconnect. Some of them, like this one, have you can run two slots at a time. So you can even clone yeah. hard drives. Let's see. Yeah, um, they're they're very, very useful. I keep trying to convince uh work to let me buy one, but it's not on the priority list right now. There, hello, hello. Brady decided to come. You want to come on the show, Brady? Come, get my hits up, kitty. Here, oh, knock my headphones out. Hello, hello, people chat. And, and Brady's looking down, like, what, what, what? Wait, wait, I'm up. What the hell's hello? going on here? Oh, can't hear you from that one. Damn it. Hang on, kitty. Hang on. I'll let you down. Cat. Hello, oh, Brady. Internet cat. Doesn't like looking at the camera. He doesn't. He like he'd be scared of everything. Yes, kitty. Kitty likes riches. Cat. Cat. 
Big fluffy. Okay, there you go. There you go. Go run off and do stuff. Go break things. Um. So and anyway, in, in the long term, this is actually there is the upfront cost of having to pay for the dock to begin with, yep. but in the long run, it does run you a good deal cheaper. Then what are you doing? <laughs> What you, you told him to go off and break things. And he's he's off and breaking things. Oh god. He's... I don't know if you heard him skid over into the corner there. Ah oh, cat. Anyway. I, I saw a, a white looks like a small footstool, and there's a white tail coming up behind it. Yeah. So anyway, hopefully that answers that question for you. Yeah. One thing I will say about the uh, docking station. Relatively few of them support multiple uh um what you would call it uh interfaces so it's it, you're gonna look for basically you're gonna find sata yeah a sata hard drive. Yeah. Uh, if you for whatever reason find one that uses ide i would just avoid it because you're not going to find too many more of those drives anymore yeah and for Antiques. a second there it looked, like the back of, it looked like the back of your head had a tail Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, there he is, and oh yeah, I, I, you see him barely there. He's attacking his his scratching post in the background. Oh, that's what they. Okay, I thought that was a stool. Psst. Silly little beast. Anyway, Cat. um, our next question, sadly, is going to have. Brady, I'm trying to work here, buddy. Um, he doesn't. Uh, our next question is going to have a rather unfortunate answer that I don't think you're going to like. Um, this comes from Michael. He says, uh, not, not that one, not, not that one, but a, a different one. Says, my Apple Care is expired, and I'm not the money to keep maintaining my MacBook if the thing dies on me again. I decide to switch over to PC once the day finally comes. I back up my data somewhat regularly, however, I do run multiple programs requiring keys like Adobe CS6, Amberlight, and Manga Studio, and I've heard Manga, I say Manga, 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 Manga Studio, and I've heard that transferring applications from Mac to PC is a nightmare to itself. Is there any way to make this process painless? Yes. No. Drink two-fifths of vodka. <laughs> no, 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 it, there is no. There is no way. I'm not even, I'll be honest with you, I'm not even 100% sure that you can transfer those keys. No, you can't. To PC versions. You can't. What well, you... something like something at Manga Studio, maybe, because because they're not the same. They're not the same level of company unless they are produced by the same. Who makes Manga Studio? I don't, I don't know. know. Okay, so Adobe, they can be real pain in the ass. Yeah, uh, especially since CS six is that the latest one? No, uh, Creative. Creative they've gone they've gone cloud. So yeah, they're, creative cloud, to, yeah. they're not gonna want to sell you keys anyway. Yeah. Um so transferring, yeah, I there is there's no good way I know of. Yeah, the piece here's the thing about these software keys. When, when when you buy most software, sometimes you'll get a key for it, which you have to register it online to unlock it or activate it. Those keys are most often platform specific. Meaning that a Windows key will not enable you to use, like, say, for example, Premiere on Macintosh. And an Office for Mac key won't allow you to use Microsoft Office on Windows. They don't go, they're, they're, they don't go back and forth. So, and this is one of the biggest hurdles and, and one of the problems with switching platforms like this. You'll have to buy new copies of all your software. So, again, unless it's a smaller company that has a really good support structure, there's a handful of them. I, and don't quote me on this one exactly, but I want to say a company like ImageLine, which does sound software mm. at, for Mac and PC, uh, will absolutely work with you and say, yes, you had, but to be fair, ImageLine's a special case because once you buy their software, you get free upgrades for life. So I bought it when it was FL Studio 6, and they're on 10 now or something like that. Some companies are good about that sort of thing. 
Some yeah. companies will give you two keys when you get soft, one for Mac and one for PC. True. But not all. And yeah. it can't, especially the larger companies like Microsoft and others that make uh, work critical software, do not give multiple keys. Because fuck you. Yeah, a, a, sh a short rule of thumb is the more expensive the software is, the less likely they are to have given you that that multiple key thing. So you should you may need to check and make sure if a company does or does not. The policies vary. It's it's and, up to the company. And I couldn't tell you the first thing about trying to uh, a way to run Apple software on a PC. You know with an emulator of any kind. I don't now, know. The small shred of good news is a document file in Word format on Mac will work in Word format on Windows. Documents are made to be able to transfer them yes. across platforms. Well, and the, and the main reason for that, by the way, is because Microsoft, when they did this, and email became a big thing, and suddenly people were emailing documents and spreadsheets and everything. They go, well, we don't know if the company at this end is going to, especially when they made their versions for Mac. Yeah. We don't know if this company is going to have Mac and going to send their stuff to guys who have PC. It's it's going to really, they're, they're going to blame us when they can't read each other's documents. Most, most software these days, if there's a Mac version of it, the format for the, the file, however. They're save files. Their save files will work on Windows and Windows will work on Mac. Most of the time, some of them most don't, but most of the time it does. So you will have an easier time, at least, moving your files over and accessing them again. Hopefully, fingers fucking crossed. But yeah, in terms of your, if you have mission critical software on Mac, you expect to have to pay for it again on Windows. You may not. You may be pleasantly surprised, but go ahead and make the expectation. That is that is one of the biggest problems with switching platforms. That's why people don't do it quite as often, because a lot of stuff just doesn't work, and you know, and it's a lot of hassle. Yeah. All right. Um. Next one, I believe this was. Was this an, uh? Who sent this one? Ah, uh, damn. If this is the thermal one, it, it doesn't have a, a damn. name. Sometimes people don't send that. Um, got an it's obviously someone we've helped before. Yeah, I got an interesting little question here, and I'm going to look this up. Um, it's regarding thermal paste, one of the most exciting aspects of computing. Right up there with catching voltage. Oh, how how do I how how do I even begin to describe on this one? Um. Thermal paste. What is it? What can it do? Is it a food? No. No. Most, es most especially is not food. Um, Th Thermal paste is a little uh, bit of goop, effectively, that you put between components to make them transfer heat between each other more efficiently. Yes. Because when you've got two chunks of metal, say, uh, the top of the CPU, and then the top of the heat sink, or the bottom of the heat sink, depending on how you're looking at it. Um, yes, you can butt them, butt them together, bare metal to bare metal, but that doesn't mean you've got a good solid contact between them. And so by putting thermal paste in there, you're making sure that there is that contact. Well, so let's, that heat let's transfers take it a little bit more basic, a little bit more basic. If you look inside your computer, or even if you open up your laptop, there's a big honking hunk of metal in there attached to a fan. That's your heat sink and fan. The reason is modern processors put out a ton of heat. And if they ran without, it's essentially an air-cooled radiator, like an old Volkswagen. If it ran without that radiator, it would burn itself out in seconds and die. I'd say minutes, but yes. Um... What you, what you see when you see a processor, I'll see if I can give you a good picture here so you have some reference. Um, these And this is mo mostly with, with modern processors. Yeah, um, back in the days of uh, uh, the 
early computers, like my dad's first computer had a 10 meg hard drive and he was never sure how he was going to fill it up. Uh, those computers, I don't recall having heat sinks because they weren't running very fast. They didn't need them. And while Nash is looking at pictures, by running fast, it's going, it's making, it's, you know, cycles. It's, it's, they say square waves, it's not really squarish, it's square looking. Basically, the faster you do those waves, the more heat is generated. Yeah. Now, now your modern CPU will look a lot like that. It'll have a big flat square of metal on it. That's actually not the CPU. That is a piece of metal on top of the transistors and the chip itself that's there to enable the transistor to get rid of all the heat that will cause it to self-destruct. You take your heat sink and fan, which is that big honking piece of metal, you push it up against that square right there, and it allows the heat to go from the transistor to the big honking piece of metal, and then the fan cools a pe honking piece of metal off and nothing explodes. Now, you, th you look at these and you think, oh, both of these are really flat, they look like they butt together, you know, fit together really easily, and you wouldn't need stuff. But just because something looks flat doesn't mean it is flat. Yeah, between the bottom, even a flat, super flat, shiny piece of metal, if you look at it at a microscopic level, there are pits and tiny indentations in it that it's actually not very flat at all. It, and, and it doesn't matter if it looks flat. We're talking about physics here. Those tiny little indentations on the flat piece of metal, when you put them together, they may be very, very flat to the naked eye, but they're actually kind of rough against each other. And those little pits and gaps, those tiny, tiny little imperfections in the metal, mean the heat does not transfer efficiently from one surface to the other. That's where thermal paste comes in. Thermal paste is this goop that you put on the metal that fills in those microscopic pits and pores and allows an efficient transfer of heat from your processor to the big honking piece of metal that will make your processor not burst into flames. Um, well, you're not supposed to just slather the things in. in no, we, we'll, we'll get there. Um, now, first, he asks us uh, what brand we would recommend. Now, for the longest time, there was... Um, Only like two brands. <laughs> Well, th there was one in the, in, the, in the industry called Arctic Silver, which yeah. was considered the best and was used. But one of the problems that's cropped up over, over time is that Arctic Silver, based on the way it was made, would dry out and turn into this crumbly, caked-on mess that would, would actually degrade the thermal transfer over time. Now, there's a new one that stepped up by a confusingly similarly named company called Arctic. Don't mix these up. That's what they want you to do. Why would you do this? A company called Arctic makes a compound called, I believe the current version is MX4. That one is about pretty much everyone considers that the... Uh, the new gold standard. Yeah, the new gold is MX4, MX5. But MX4, Arctic MX. Um, that, it's... Arctic Silver was silver-based, as the name implies. Arctic 4 is carbon-based. And the, the, it's uh, non-conductive, non-capacitive, which means it's made not to short out electrical components, which is good. Which is good. Now, in terms of application, more is not better. When you're building a new computer, and you need to attach your heat sink to the CPU... Do not just start slathering that stuff everywhere. It, it, it's not like, you know, Ben Gay or something. It's not like Preparation H. Don't do it. <clears throat> okay? More is not better. It's not like lube. More is not better. <clears throat> um, the amount that they say to put down, it'll, it'll, be on the, it'll be on the instructions, but it's a very small amount. We're talking like, I wouldn't quite say pinhead amounts, but it's not much more than that. Yeah, here's, uh, um, I'm going to show you another picture. Here is about kind of the recommended blot that you should put on your heat sink when you do it. Yeah, here we go. That tiny little, 
Oh, God damn it. A tiny little God damn it. Um, yeah, that little dot right there in the center. Maybe even a little less than that. Why? Here's how you apply it. You put that dot on there. You very carefully line up your brand new heat sink. You press it straight down, and then you lock your heat sink in place as quickly as you can. That the, the pressure between the two will force the material to spread out evenly. And that's it. That's all yeah. you have to do. Arctic Silver used to say, get, get a, I want to see if I remember this correctly, get like an index card. Mm -hmm. Or a credit card or business card. Yeah, yeah and, and use the tip of that to spread it around. But with the MX, you don't need to do that. Well, and you, that is just such a mess. And, and I, you know what? If you're anything like me and you work with computers and stuff, liquids and gels are not your bag. They're not, maybe if you're in, you know, like biochemistry or if you're into that sort of technical sort of stuff, you're all down with the gooey shit. But I tend to find engineers, they're less comfortable with gooey shit. They like things that lock into place and have, you know, you know bits and tabs and slots and just click. So. I said it depends on the engineer. Mechanical seem yeah. to be fine with, with uh you know, grease and, and, and oils. You just, now, another thing to, to keep in mind when you're doing this, never, ever, ever touch either that flat metal top of your CPU or the bottom of your heat sink. Never do this, especially with your fingertips. Never do that. Your fingers have oils on them. A little and those And those oils can be very corrosive to those components. And not only that, even that oil, even a little tiny bit of it, will interrupt the thermal transfers. It's not a thermally conductive substance. It's not made for that. It's it's made. Uh, why do we have oily things? I don't understand that. Anyway, it's not made to transfer thermals. So, um, also keep in you don't let hairs or dust. You want to keep those surfaces as clean as you physically possibly can, but until you mount that heat sink on there. Normally, you'll have a little plastic cover for each. When you're assembling a computer, keep those on and in place until you're absolutely ready to put things together and let them go. So now, just to point out for the people who feel less capable than others on building their own computers, mm -hmm. there are a handful of heat sink types that come with the thermal paste preloaded on there. Yeah. So you just go. I take the plastic thing off the CPU, I take the plastic thing covering the thermal paste off the heat sink, and I just lock it down. Yes. Just so you don't even have to slather shit. And you know what? That stuff is not the top of the line, but it will do the job adequately and it won't cause you any problems. Yeah, and if you're, and if you're not doing massive amounts of overclocking, you'll be fine. Yeah. I, otherwise, if you're doing it yourself or if you're having to redo one, sometimes you have to clean off the old paste and put on new. Um, MX4 is good. MX4 I would definitely recommend. And once you get a tube of that stuff, you're pretty much set for a decade. Unless you're constantly building computers every single day. One tube of that stuff, what's the prices right now? Um, I think it's around $10. $10. That'll last you for a fucking decade. You won't even have to do anything. You're fine. So hopefully we, help, hopefully we helped there and covered that. We weren't too rambly and all right, next one's from Emilio. Of course, the last few weeks, I've been upgrading my six-year-old gaming rig. I've added an extra eight gigs of RAM, blah, 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 blah. Um, the only problem is my Intel Core i5-750 is beginning to show their age. Um, the problem is upgrading to a new Intel processor and motherboard is a minute would cost 300 to 500, which I don't have. Um, oh, this got all scrambled together. Uh, would this be, no, this, oh, okay, Emilio asked the question about thermal paste. That's why I got scrambled together. This one comes from Will Jar. Sorry. Cut and pasty, you got all scrambled together. Anyway. Ah, uh, okay. Will Jar is asking, um, I know you said that AMD processors are inferior to Intel. Um, should I get an AMD FX6300 and AM3 motherboard for around 150 or should I consider buying, buying another Intel processor? Buy another Intel processor. 
I th- do not don't don't if you re- especially if you especially if you're looking at you know basically a drop in replacement sort of deal yeah. where you're not going to have to spend afterwards hours dealing with Microsoft and reinstalling a bunch of your software where it suddenly goes I don't like playing with AMD nearly yeah. as much. Uh, frustrate part of it calculate how much your time is worth. Will how much you think your time is worth and go is the extra money really worth it. Will Jar saying, should I buy a used Intel processor? Well, first off, obviously, buyer beware, because I assume you're going to be going to eBay for this. So, obviously, check their seller ratings, see how, how well they fare. And the return policy. And the return policy. Um, used processors, if you feel, could understand, this is all on you at this point, okay? If you feel comfortable doing this, you shouldn't really have a problem with used processors, mainly because these things last for fucking ever. The only, most of the time, people upgrade not because the processor's gone bad, but because it's gone obsolete, and they're looking for a newer, faster one. So if you think you, if you trust the seller, if the seller's got a good reputation, eBay's really good about that sort of stuff, if you trust the seller, I would honestly go, maybe go with a new Intel processor. Now, the, the the FX series, don't get me wrong, they're not awful, but compared to Intel, they're not the good value that they seem to be. That FX 6300 may give you a bit of a boost over the, 70, uh, the 750, but uh, in, t- in the long term, in the long run, you would be so much better off getting the Intel. And my point, the, the, what shows that is you're still running an i5-750, which is what, a seven-year-old CPU at this point? I think so. And it's still keeping, tra- it's a little slower, but it's still keeping track. Consider these an investment. You will be able to run an Intel CPU much longer and much better than an AMD one. Mainly because a- AMD's just been having so many problems with, with their output lately. They, they just, they really aren't competing very well. Um, I would honestly encourage you to save up and, and invest in a new one. An i5, one of the, what, a generation behind the current level of i5 processors will do you just fine. And you may be able to get a little bit of a deal on that. And it will last for a long time until you absolutely have to. Okay, he can get a used i5 2500K for $130. If it, that'll work with your motherboard, I say go for it. 2500K is still a solid processor these days. It is. And even for gaming. So, yeah, that'll work. I would recommend that as opposed to, the, the, to getting an AMD, especially because... You really don't want to lock yourself into a different ecosystem like the AMD. Like Mike was saying, we started. If you switch your motherboard to a different brand, not just you know a different manufacturer, but AMD Intel, if you switch it like that, Windows gets confused and don't want to start. So because it has to, the two CPUs have different kinds of drivers. It will have to download all new drivers rearrange itself and sometimes it can result in blue screens and other issues it's not a drop-in replacement yeah if it were we might be more comfortable saying okay yeah you can try this but i wouldn't want to do it i just i've been so leery about amd's fx series in, in, in the long run um just yeah that that just no no all right well we're coming up on the top of the hour i think we, we've covered everything have this week and, and all and we still have some extra questions i wish we could have got to every single question let's see maybe we have a, have a second time for like one more let's see no that last one would be too much to go into we'll have to save that for next time um well i think that's that that pretty much covers it for this week thank you everyone for sending in your questions if you have questions you want us to answer send them to Requests at radiodeadair.com. Put tech Q&A in the subject line. Maybe we'll attempt to, uh, to to look after these for you. Um, thank you, Mike. As you oh, sure. 
And uh, we'll be back in two weeks. Good night, everybody.